Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to another production from the Rod of Shubhat. I'm your brother Akhil, and today, inshallah, we want to address you on this day of December 25th. Before we do that, my apologies, as I expressed to you in some past videos, that due to my travels uh, for work, I have not been able to um, consistently sit down and continue our series that we have on our channel and because of travels I don't have the means and the resources to be able to provide you uh, with continued videos so inshallah once we return back um, to our place of residence and to my office where my equipment is and I can get back to making videos inshallah we will do that and we ask for your continued patience and your continued support and your continued dua that Allah will make matters easy for us, inshallah. Today, I want to make a short video, inshallah, about this day, December 25th. And I want to appeal in this video to Muslims, non-Muslims, adults, children, uh, and leave us, inshallah, with an admonition and something to reflect upon as related to this day in relation to Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him. I dare not say that today is Jesus' birthday, as is the reported idea of December 25th, because as Muslims, for sure, we do not believe this. As well as even some non-Muslims, even Christians will understand that December 25th is not the actual birthday of Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him, and we would touch on upon this uh, in the video and information that comes to follows, uh, inshallah. But um, I want to leave us with something to think about, that when this day comes around next year, or the following year, or the year after, we have something to ground ourselves with and use in relation to how we as Muslims should encounter this day and um, behave interact interact and relate on this day to christians or people of other faiths the first thing i want to do is i want to mention five points about what it is about jesus that christians believe versus what muslims believe five points i want to mention about isa alayhi salam jesus peace be upon him as relates to what christians believe about him Versus what Muslims believe about him. First, what the Christians believe about Jesus, peace be upon him, is he's the incarnate of God. That Jesus, peace be upon him, is God incarnate. Which means he is God in the flesh. This is a Christian belief. And not all Christians believe this, but this is the dominant belief amongst the majority of the Christian denominations. The second belief they have is that Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. So they believe that God is triune, and there's three parts to Him. There's the Father, who is a person, the Son, who is a person, and the Holy Spirit, who is a person. And these three persons make up one being called God. And as we to the first point, the Son, the second person, of the triune God came in flesh onto the earth. So this is the concept called the Trinity. Again, not all Christians believe in this idea of the Trinity. So this idea that God is triune is not an uh, absolute belief amongst all Christians. You have Unitarians, you have people who do not believe this idea. Also people like Jehovah's Witness, they don't believe in the idea of the Trinity. But they believe still, or the second belief of the Christians, that is Jesus is the Son of God. What does the idea of Son of God means? It's a big discussion. Um, but this is the second point. The third point is that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Messiah, or in, in, in the Greek language, and known um, traditionally amongst people, is to Christ. Jesus Christ means Jesus the Messiah. We say Al-Masih, 
or the anointed one. And this is what the Messiah means. It means one who's anointed. Uh, in Arabic, Masaha it means to wipe over, to make Masah. We know this even from uh, what we do when we make wudu. Sometimes you wipe over your khufain, your your footwear. Um, so this means one who is anointed, one who has been uh, anointed by God, and raised up and elected by God. So this is the uh, religious view of what the Messiah is uh, as relates to Muslims, that he is one anointed by God, but this does not raise him to the level of divinity or equal with God. Unlike what the Christians believe about him, the idea of the Messiah is somehow that this equates Jesus with being God um, in uh, the bigger scheme of things. As Muslims, we don't believe this. Uh, fourth point is that Jesus, he came to die for the sins of humanity. That Jesus, alayhi salam, peace be upon him, he came to die for the sins of humanity. He came to die on the cross so that God could forgive humanity for their sins. Because according to the Christian belief is that humanity was so sunken into the depths of darkness that the only way for God to redeem them and bring them to salvation was for himself, God, to incarnate himself, become a man, and enter into creation. And then that same man, who was a God-man, had to be killed in order for God himself to forgive humanity for their sins. This, in essence, is the belief of the Christians. Again, let's recap quickly so you can understand. And as I mentioned, I want to also try to appeal to the younger crowd, the younger audience, so I will repeat it, and I hope you understand what I'm saying. The Christian doctrine about the message of Jesus coming to die for our sins is connected to the total essence of their belief about God. And that is, God was so disgusted with humanity because they have sunken into the depths of sin and darkness and depravity and disobedience and idolatry before God that the only way God can redeem them to forgive them, He cannot just say, I forgive you for your sins, but rather there had to be a sacrifice. There had to be some type of blood spilt. And the only way that God would accept this blood that was spilt in order to forgive humanity for their sins, is that this blood, this blood had to be 100% holy. And the only way that this blood could be 100% holy is if it was God himself who actually incarnated himself, became flesh, took on the personification of a human being, and come and be killed for the sins of humanity so that God can now say, you are forgiven under the blood of Christ. This is the Christian doctrine. This is what they believe. And this is how you achieve salvation in Christianity. By believing in the idea that Jesus came to die for your sins. And when you believe that, you are now saved under grace. Under the blood of Jesus dying for your sins. God, the sovereign, all-powerful, all-loving, God, in order to forgive humanity, had to himself, incarnate himself, come himself to the world, be humiliated himself, mocked on, mocked at, spit on, chased, and eventually killed, all in order for him himself to forgive humanity for their sins. Again, God himself had to come in the form of a human being himself to kill himself to be killed by others knowing that he would be killed so it's a type of suicide in order to forgive humanity for their sins and now the only way for one to be forgiven before God it's to believe that God done this action in order for you to be saved and forgiven. This is what it means when the Christians say that Jesus came to die for our sins. 
it doesn't mean sin will stop. Because even though over 2,000 years ago, according to Christian doctrine, Jesus came and died, nonetheless, sin is still committed and even more widespread now than it was then. So what actually took place? It wasn't to stop sin, but it was in order for God to now be able to look upon human beings under the blood of Jesus and say, you're forgiven. This, we believe, is very extreme and very inconsistent with the message and the ways of God. But this is what the Christians believe. And that's point number four. Point number five is that Jesus will return. And also, the Muslims believe this as well, but our belief and what this return entails is quite different. So these are the five beliefs that Christians have about Jesus, peace be upon them. Again, recap. One is they believe that Jesus is God incarnate, that Jesus is God in the flesh. He is the second person of the triune God incarnated in flesh. Second belief is that the Christians believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Son of God in this triune or this trinity of beings. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the second person of that trinity is known as the Son or Jesus. Now, not all Christians believe in the trinity, but those who don't believe in the trinity still believe in that Jesus is the Son of God. So, with, with that distinction between the different denominations, they all believe, nonetheless, that Jesus is the Son of God. And this is not a belief that Muslims hold, as we will come to shortly, inshallah. Point number three is that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. And the Christians, as well as the Muslims, share this belief, but again, with different understandings um, and different conclusions about what that means. Point number four is Christians believe Jesus Peace be upon him, Isa alayhi salam, his name is pronounced in Arabic. Um, Jesus alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, he came to die for the sins of humanity. This is not a belief of Muslims. We don't believe this, and we will explain shortly. And the last one is that Jesus will return. These are the five principal beliefs that Christians hold about Jesus, peace be upon him, in order for one to consider himself to be a Christian. If you deny any of these five, then in fact, maybe you might not be considered a true Christian. By some, with the exception of the first two, where there's a big um, um, difference between Trinitarians and Unitarians as it relates to the divinity of Jesus and God being triune versus God being one. So this is what the Christians believe about Isa, about Jesus, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. As for the Muslims, what we believe about Isa, alayhi salam, Jesus, peace be upon him, is that we believe in opposition to point number one of the Christians that Jesus is God incarnate. We have no such idea or no such belief that God himself can become a man or into creation. We do not believe this as Muslims and we would never accept any beliefs that are similar to this. God is one without any partners or associates. And this is fundamental and very pivotal to our belief that we reiterate over and over again. We make the Shahada. And that testification is La ilaha illallah or Ashadu an la ilaha illallah or Ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That we testify, we bear witness that there is no God except Allah. La sharika lahu. And he has no partners or no associates. So this idea of uh, a trinity is something foreign and completely opposed to the tenets of Islam and something completely opposed to the traditional understanding of God prior to the advent of the New Testament writers. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, you find emphatically God stating he is one. He has no partners. He don't share his glory. There's none besides him. He's the only savior. On and on and on, you find this. I am a jealous God. Don't worship anyone besides me. Don't worship anyone with me. Um, this is this is Old Testament um, statements uh, that we find about God. And then you have the New Testament that's very vague. And then you have the Christian doctrine that comes later that uh, introduces this idea of a trinity of beings amongst God, a trinity of, of persons uh, amongst the one being of God. Uh, correction, so that way we know we're representing the Christian belief correctly. So point number one for the Muslims is that God is one 
without partners. He has no associates and there's nothing comparable to him. Number two is that God, as for Muslims, God was not born, nor did he sire anyone. God was not born, nor did he sire anyone. And sire means to father. Sire means to father. So there's a very interesting verse in the Quran which explicitly says this. And it debunks and refutes any idea of the of um of anyone holding to the beliefs that God has children or that God was born. Because according to Christian doctrine, you have a clear contradiction. You believe that God is a father, and you also believe that God is a son. So that means that God himself was born. Yes? Because you believe God the Son. And you also believe that God the Father gave, um, he sired or fathered a child. Because you say Jesus is the Son of God. There's a beautiful verse in a very short chapter of the Quran. Chapter named So Ikhlas. And in it Allah says, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. God did not father or sire anyone, nor was he born. God did not bring anyone into existence in any type of physical um, contribution, nor was he brought into existence through any type of interaction of that or like that. So God was not born, nor did God father or sire anyone. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. So this is in complete contrast to what the Christians believe about there being a son for God. God does not have children, daughters, or males. God does not have parents. God does not have a genealogy. God does not have an ancestry. God is God. He's one, independent, and free from all imperfections. Subhanahu amma yushrikum. And glory be to Allah. Glory be to God above whatever they ascribe and associate with him. Point number three of the Muslims is that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is Al-Masih. He is the anointed one, and he is the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose and raised up to be the final prophet and messenger sent to the long line of prophets and messengers that were sent to the children of Israel. Isa alayhi salam was the children of Israel's last opportunity to get they act together before God took the favor that he gave to this lineage of, 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 of prophethood and took it and gave it to someone else. So Jesus was the one chosen for this message. And when he came, his people denied him. They rejected him. Uh, they fought against him, uh, um, chased him out uh, of his place. Um, and even though it, uh, it wasn't in any um, severe way, like we find with other prophets and messengers, even the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who was chased from his city and fought against uh, for 13 years or 10 years plus, uh, still Jesus was opposed and rejected, and the people tried to harm him, but God protected him and took him up to Himself, and God would send him back. As we come to the final point, uh, God would send him back uh, to make judgment against those people who claim, first and foremost allegiance to Jesus and also those who claim that they got rid of Jesus peace be upon him so both people who claim that they harmed him or killed him as well as those who claim affinity to him but don't truly believe him with a true message both of these uh, communities will suffer um, a rude awakening when Jesus returns but the, the idea of Jesus is the Messiah and the Muslim understanding is that he is the elected one that God rose up, anointed to be the final prophet and messenger that completed the prophets and messengers in his line of prophethood to the children of Israel. Point number four, or what the Muslims believe about Isa alayhi salam, in relation to what the Christians believe, is that Jesus came to restore a balance and sincerity to deviant Jew Jewish communities. The Christians believe that Jesus came to die for the sins of humanity. 
We don't believe this. We don't believe anyone can come and die for your sins. Your sin is your sin. And you will be responsible for your sin. As the law says in the Quran clearly that every man's fate is tied to his own neck. What you do, you'll be responsible for. Good or bad. And you cannot be responsible for something that someone else do in and of itself. Although, according to Christian, according to Muslim um, belief, if you initiated something which was a bad thing and people followed you in that, then you can incur uh, anger from God and punishment for that because you was one who contributed to people deviating and doing wrong under your influence. So because of that, you can be punished by God because you caused people or others to do something that was in disobedience against God. But the idea of someone dying for your sins, then this is a foreign concept um, to Islam. And it's also a foreign concept to um, the biblical teachings prior to the New Testament writings. And when I say this, I'm trying to be as politically correct as possible by saying prior to the New Testament writings, because if one studies the Old Testament, they will find an extreme deviation in beliefs and teachings after the New Testament writings about some of the previous prophets, and even though they use the same book. And it's interesting because Allah in the Quran says that the Jews say the Christians stand upon nothing, and the Christians say that the Jews stand upon nothing, yet they read from the same book. This is an ayat from the Quran. That they say, the Jews say to the Christians, you stand upon nothing. And the Christians say to the Jews, you stand upon nothing. Yet they read from the same book. The Jews claim or attribute falsehood to Christians. And the Christians attribute falsehood to the Jews. Yet they're reading from the same book. So there's something for us to think about. But nonetheless, I say prior to New Testament writings because many of the ideas and beliefs that come with the New Testament writings is a, a deviation away from what the prior communities of Jews believe um, um, with their respective prophets and teachings. All right, And this idea of dying for someone's sins is one of them. For instance, we find in Ezekiel, it says, Do not say... This is, a, um, this is not in Ezekiel, it's another verse, but I quote this verse and then Ezekiel after. But it says, Do not say that the children's teeth are crooked because of the sour grapes the parents ate. Meaning, what your father has done, you cannot be held responsible for. And in, according to Ezekiel, it says quite clearly that the son, the, the, um, the, the crime or the sin of the wicked should be upon the wicked and the righteous of the righteous should be upon the righteous. But no one can be a bearer of another's uh, burden or sin. So this is consistent with what we find in the Quran as well. So the idea that Jesus came to die for your sins is a belief that we, we as Muslims, we do not hold to be uh, truthful. All right, We don't believe that this was what the message of Jesus was. We believe that this is a fabrication that was... Um, put upon the, the teachings of Isa alayhi salam and it has no foundation from Isa alayhi salam himself. And the fifth belief of what the Muslims believe as it relates to what the Christians believe is that Jesus will return. And we do believe that Isa alayhi salam will return in the end time and when he returns he will address and he will bring justice to those first who say that they killed him and also he will address and refute those who say that they believed in him and raised up him to be a God and did things in his name that he had no authority to do. So you have some of them from amongst the Jews and you have some of them from amongst the Christians that claim and attribute to Isa alayhi salam both blasphemous beliefs and ideas and practices and also uh, oppression against him that when he returns back he will deal with his people and... Um, bring justice uh, amongst them as it relates to that. Now this is a summary of what the Muslims believe versus what the Christians believe as it relates to Isa alayhi salam. So I wanted to begin with this and I wanted us to have this as a backdrop 
So understanding the difference between the Christian doctrine as it relates to Isa alayhi salam and the Muslim doctrine as it relates to Isa alayhi salam, peace be upon him. In, in general. Now, I wanted to ask a question. And I ask for your indulgence for another few minutes, inshallah. I want to ask a question. What does Christmas have to do with Isa, Jesus, peace be upon him? What does Christmas have to do with Isa, do with Jesus, peace be upon him? The short answer is absolutely nothing. Christmas, December 25th, has absolutely nothing to do with Jesus, Isa, alayhi salam, peace be upon him. Absolutely nothing. This is the short answer. The long answer, and short, is that first and foremost, Christmas, as you understand today, in modern times, is a bid'ah. It's an innovation that has been placed upon another bid'ah, innovation as it relates to Isa, alayhi salam. What you have today in Christmas has absolutely nothing to do with what was initially understood to be Jesus' birthday, which that itself had nothing to do with Isa alayhi salam. What do you mean? Today, Christmas is a commercial tool used by the capitalist system in order to rob humanity for their money. This is at essence what Christmas is. It's a commercial institution now. It's a means, a tool by those who are in control of this capitalist society used to take the money from the poor and give it back to the rich. Us poor people spend more money during the time of Christmas than spent throughout the rest of the year. Check the stats. Check uh, how much money is spent from after Thanksgiving, Black Friday, when you see people line up to department stores and sleep in their cars and stay overnight for this special sale from Black Friday up until the beginning or the end of the year, New Year's. How much money is spent in giving back to these capitalist uh, organizations or companies that controls uh, the masses of people? This is what it's become now. The, the bid'ah, the fabrication, the innovation of Santa Claus and reindeers and all this stuff. All of this stuff is, is all bid'ah to the Christian doctrine. But the initial belief of December 25th and Jesus being born this day is also a bid'ah that was faulted upon Isa alayhi salam. Because when you read the Bible itself, it tells you what time of year Jesus was, was born in, if you read carefully, according to the Bible itself, the time of year Jesus was born is that the date palm trees were ripe. They were ripe. And they gave fresh dates. Jesus was born over 2,000 years ago in modern day Palestine. Maybe not many of you knew that. But Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, and if you Christians out there, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, was born over 2,000 years ago in what is known as modern-day Palestine. So technically, Jesus will be classified as what? A Palestinian. Think about that one. But nonetheless, date palm trees in Palestine over 2,000 years ago or today are not ripen and give off fresh dates in the end of December. It just doesn't happen. So this is clear from the description of the Bible of when Jesus was born. It was not December 25th. But what happened is that in early Christianity, Christianity was taken over by many um, cultures that they uh, was under. And they had many different influences. And one of those influences was the idea of another pagan god ideology. And where this god was born, died, and resurrected for the sins of humanity. And this god was born on December 
25th. Now, I want to give you some homework to my Christian brothers and sisters. I want to give you some homework. I would like for you to find out in history what pagan deity and religion resembles and models this idea of a deity being born incarnate and then being sacrificed for the sins of humanity and also was born on December 25th. Please leave your answer in the comment section and inshallah we can do a follow up video after. But this is, I want you to consider this. So this bid'ah of Santa Claus and all of these things, it's a bid'ah upon bid'ah. It's a bid'ah in Arabic, it means innovation. It means, it means something that they invented. that had nothing to do with the foundational teachings of the um, belief itself. It's an innovation. And in this case, it's an innovation upon innovation. And this is why it's very important for Muslims for us to have our deen pure and intact and to stay away from innovations. To stay away from adding things into our deen that has no part of it. As the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, as narrated by Aisha, that whoever introduces anything into this matter of ours, I mean this deen, it will be rejected. So the Muslims, we are very staunch and very careful about things being inter int introduced into our religion that's not from it, so our religion can stay pristine and pure as it was given to us from the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Okay, so this is the long answer. But none, uh, nonetheless, Christmas has absolutely nothing to do with, with Isa, Jesus, peace be upon him. And as Muslims, we should also stay away from partaking and involving ourselves in innovation upon innovation in a religion that's not even ours. It has nothing to do with us, and we should stay away from it. Some may ask, well, what do you say to family members that say to you, Merry Christmas and like this, which is a question that comes up every single year and over and over again. Um, so we have many fatawa that's out there about this. I will give you a principle. I will give you a principle. We know amongst Muslims, we have a greeting and that greeting is Assalamu Alaikum or Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah or Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. We say this to our Muslim brother and sisters. If someone says to you, Assalamu Alaikum, you respond with equal or better. If someone responds to you or someone greets you with Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh, then you respond back, Wa Alaikum wa wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. And this is equivalent to what they gave to you. Alhamdulillah. The greeting is a dua. It's a supplication. You're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're asking God Almighty to give this person peace and blessings and mercy. Because this will only be given by the Lord of the worlds. So this is what we have amongst ourselves as Muslims. When we greet each other, we begin, Assalamu Alaikum. When we uh, depart, we say, Assalamu Alaikum. This is how we, we greet and we, how we leave or depart each other. When we meet non-Muslims, there's nothing that um, mandates us to initiate the greeting to them, although it's a courtesy. But our greeting that we have amongst ourselves as believers is not the same greeting that we have amongst people who don't believe in the same thing we do. So to say hi, how you doing, hello, good morning, um, things like this, there's no problem to say these things. They're arm, they're very general. But when there's something that includes um, some type of religious sentiment along these lines, we should be very careful of it and stay away from it. Even if those sentiments have been watered down or don't have the same meaning as it had before, still it's something associated with their religious belief and we should not initiate or respond back to these um, types of greetings. But we do have a principle that one time someone said to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam something of a greeting, but they meant something bad by it. And the Prophet, he responded to them, he said, Wa alaykum. So if someone, a non-Muslim, greets you as a Muslim, he may be greeting you out of sincerity because he wants to give you peace or he wants to extend peace to you. He may be mocking you. He may be doing what's called sukhriya. He may be doing anything, you know. But when you respond back to him, 
it's sufficient for you to say wa alaykum and for you too and upon your soul and what this means is that whatever the person said whatever they intended whatever they meant by the greeting whether it was sincere or not or with mockery or uh, sarcasm we say wa alaykum whatever their intent is back to you the same for you if you meant me good and extend a peace the same for you if you meant to try to insult me the same for you and this is sufficient for us someone says happy holidays the same for you the same to you merry christmas the same to you you don't have to get into hair splitting and this just the same to you and that's sufficient and this is with respect this is you you're not you're not uh disrespecting anybody you're not making anybody feel any bad uh, make feel make anyone feel bad about what you're saying the same to you with a smile and be courteous and because we people of respect we don't have to you know um be so tight but it's the same to you and that should be sufficient i want to end inshallah this video with a teaching that we find in our tradition about isa alayhi salam it's a very beautiful hadith or narration and its authenticity we find it in our books allah knows best exactly if it traced back we don't attribute it we don't say that the prophet muhammad said qala rasulullah sallallahu alaihi no we don't say this but we find it in our books and it's attributed to isa alayhi salam and we want to narrate it in allah ta'ala alam but it's a very beautiful narration and we want to look at it and examine it and see this teaching that we find from the message of isa alayhi salam how does it relate to what we find today on this day of Christmas? Look at what people do and go out of their way for for the day of Christmas. Look at the money spent and the greed and 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 uh the the um uh, incitement for you to go out and spend all this money on this day of Christmas for what? Not giving in the true sense. But spending, yes, you're gonna buy gifts and give to someone, but it's all about spending and buying stuff. I would be more appreciative if we say on December 25th you want to truly give, go out and feed the poor, go out and give to those who don't have, go out and clothe the homeless, home homeless, go out and shelter the homeless, go out and feed people who don't have any food or starving. If you took this day. And say in the name of Jesus that we do this under his name or you know in, in, in commemoration of him and re remembering him you do something do something worth something not go out and buy your son a new Xbox or buy your, or your, your spouse a new pair of shoes or a new fur coat or this or that this is not what the message of Jesus is about this is not what the message of Jesus salam, peace be upon him is about about going out and spending and wasting your money and giving you all just so you can have some gifts under some tree and hang stockings up and wait for some fairy tale fat guy to come down your small fireplace and deliver toys and stuff this is this is why would muslims want to involve our children in such a lie you're lying to your children you're teaching your children how to be liars you teach them to believe in lies it's all lies why must this be the case and even for Muslims, why must we follow these people in this system of lying? The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said and he prophesied. He said that you will follow people hand span by hand span, on with by on with, until if they went into a lizard hole, you would follow them. And the companions that said it would be the Jews and the Christians, Jihad Rasulullah, he said, who else? So now we have Muslims who want to celebrate Christmas. How do we celebrate Christmas? What does that even mean as a Muslim? It don't even make any sense. What are we going to tell our kids about this? We're going to lie to them about Santa Claus? If you don't be good, Santa won't give you toys? You're lying in the face of trying to tell your kids don't lie. You shouldn't lie because if you don't lie, Santa won't buy you something. Yet you're lying to them about Santa. There's no such thing as Santa Claus. There's no such thing as Christmas and all these, this, this, it's a big lie, but it's a lie to take your money. It's a lie to take your money. And I have to be direct with you and I have to be 
uh, clear with you on this day because I, I don't want us to fall into the trap that other people are falling into. So as Muslims, please keep your children, keep our children away from this uh, lying and sinful uh, occasion. Those who want to celebrate it amongst the non-Muslims, for whatever reasons they do it, that's their business. But it has nothing to do with us and what we believe. And we should make it clear to our children that this is not from us. This is not for us. It has nothing to do with us. And there's much better things to do than teach our children uh, about uh, these people and lying to them about Santa and flying reindeers and all this stuff. So Allah protect us. But let me read this narration. And I hope you can appreciate it. It's a very beautiful one. And I want you to examine this narration about Isa salam and his teachings as it relates to what we find, the commercialism, the greed, the incitement, you know what I'm saying, to be um, like uh, um, exaggerating in your wealth, spending like just irresponsibly. I want us to consider this narration in relation to what we find um, in comparison to Christmas. It is narrated that once a man he accompanied Isa alayhi salam and he said to him, I want to be your companion. I want to accompany you. I want to be uh, your friend on this journey. So they set forth and they reached the bank of a river and Jesus and the man, they sat down to eat and they had with them three loaves of bread. They had with them three loaves of bread. They ate two loaves and they left one. And after leaving one, Jesus, he rose up and he went to the river to drink some water. And when he returned, he found the loaf was gone. And he asked the man who was there with him, who ate the other two loaves with him, who ate the third loaf? And the man said, I do not know. I don't know who ate the third loaf. Jesus didn't rebuke him. He didn't further question him. He continued. They set forth once more with the man. Jesus and the man continued. And he saw a female deer with two of her young. And Jesus called one of the two and they came to him. He called one of the young deers and the deer came to him. And he slaughtered the, deer, the young deer. They slaughtered it. They killed it. And they ate it. They did what they had to do to eat the meat. And they ate it. After they ate Jesus and the man, the, the young deer, by a miracle, Jesus said to the bones of the deer, Rise up and go. Rise up. And the deer, it rose up in front of the man. And he saw his miracle. And it ran off. It ran off. Jesus said to him, I swear, or he, he said to him, I ask you, in the name of the one who has performed this miracle before you, who ate the third loaf? The man said, I do not know. I do not know. They continued, the two of them, and then they came to a body of water in a valley. Jesus took the man by his hand and they crossed over the water. They walked on water. And when they had crossed over, Jesus said to the man again, I ask you in the name of him who showed you this miracle right in front of your eyes, who ate the third loaf? The man said again, I do not know. I do not know. Then they came to a barren area in a desert with no water around. And they sat down. And Jesus began to gather some sand. And he gathered three piles of sand. Three piles of sand. And he asked by God's permission that the sand be turned into gold. That the pile of sand be turned into gold. And then Jesus said to the man, One pile is for me of gold. One pile is for you of gold. And one pile of this gold is for the man who ate the third loaf. One for you 
one for me, and a third pile is for the man who ate the loaf, the third loaf of bread. Then this man that was accompanying Jesus, he said, I admit, I ate the third loaf of bread. Meaning now, if I told the truth about eating the third loaf, I will also get this third pile of gold. And Jesus got up and he said to the man, all of it is for you. You can have all of it. You can have the first pile, you can have your pile, and you can have that third pile. All of it is for you. And he left the man. The man sat there with three piles of gold. And upon that came two men. Two men, and they wanted to take his gold from him. And the man said, Why don't we divide this amongst ourselves? Don't take and kill me and take all my gold, but yet let's divide it amongst ourselves. So they sent one man out to get food. He said, go get some food, come back to eat, and then we divide the portion of gold amongst ourselves. The one they sent out for food, in his mind he began to think. He said, why should I share this with them? Why don't I poison the food? And then after we eat, they will die and I will take all of the gold for myself. While the two that remain behind also plotted against the third one. He said, why should we have to divide it amongst three of us? Why not we split it and when the other one come back, we kill him? Listen to the greed of everybody involved. So what happened is the man, he came back with the food. He poisoned it. When the man came back with the food, the two that plotted against him to kill him, killed him. They killed the man who brought the food back. He's dead. He already poisoned the food. They ate the food. They ate the food and they die. Now you have three people there with three piles of gold, all dead and nothing. And after some time, Esau lay to them, he passed back by the same area. He passed back by the same area and he seen the scene. He seen what happened. He seen these three people dead there and with the gold laying there. And he said, this is the world. Beware of it. This is the world. Beware of it. Listen to this message versus what you see on your commercials and your billboards, your ads, everything about this day of Christmas and about this commercialist society that propels you to continue to spin and spin and spend and take your money and spend in nothing. In the name of what? In the name of celebrating the birthday of who? Of Isa alayhi salam? How ironic. How ironic. I ask my Christian brethren, even for you to stand up and take your religion back. Take back at least the message you find in your book about Isa alayhi salam. And don't allow the society to make a mockery of this great prophet and messenger by telling the people that this is his birthday and this is what we should be doing on this day. But for us Muslims, we also have an affinity in relationship with Isa alayhi salam. He is our prophet and he is our messenger. And he is a brother of the final prophet and messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and peace be upon them all. And if the Christians do not have the courage to take back their religion and defend the Isa of his true honor, then we should do it by clarifying who he is and what he is and the truth and his message that he brought. This is what I wanted to bring and I hope that uh, we take some benefit from it. Inshallah, I hope that this reminder was something that we can use, Inshallah, to uh, carry on and be mindful of how we deal uh, with uh, our friends, our family who aspire to um, celebrating this holiday and the way that they do. Give them some guidance. Give them something to think about, inshallah, and share with them the true message of Isa alayhi salam, the true sp spirit of Isa alayhi salam, what he truly came to bring, not commercialism and capitalism and greed 
and um, all alike, but rather to be sincere before God, to worship God alone, to be nice and kind to your neighbor. You're going to buy these expensive things, yet these people are starving right in front of you. You're spending all these thousands of dollars on stuff, yet there are people you know, saying, who don't have anything to wear in the cold, standing outside, hungry, naked, poor. How do we do this? And how do we do it in the name of celebrating the birthday of Isa alayhi salam? What a mockery. What a mockery. This is what we want to present. And we hope that there's some benefit in it. هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته